Hello, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Just a few minutes late. Um, thanks for being there. Um, I've seen in the list of people joining lots of names that I know very well and we know each other well, but all, also other people who I don't know. So just for the benefit mainly of those, um, I want to, I'd like to to explain where we're coming from. I, I, my name is Leandro Rero and uh, I run an organization called the Child Fund Project and we are organization architects focusing on three or four legs, enabling the signs uh, that uh, create remarkable organizations as we want to call them, viral change, which you may have heard of, leadership in the collective form and then accelerators uh, to accelerate the pace of a few things in the strategy, innovation, etc. I'm just showing that as a one slide commercial so people know where I'm coming from because I'm not coming from the academic side or the theoretical side. This is a praxis. Anything I'm going to share today is from the practice and the praxis for many years and therefore um, I hope that that could be useful because I can explain with uh, more detail. Now, at the core of what we're talking about in terms of the, the company culture as a social movement, I suppose there is a mismatch between the world that we are around us, which I'm not going to even to repeat and, and offend you, and insult your imagination saying that is a high pace and disruptive and 24 seven digital and the rest and the rest, but it's a certainly a completely different world from the one that we've been uh, used to just a few years ago. And at the same time, our organizational structures, way of organizing, models of leadership, etc., haven't changed that much. They're a little bit old. I think I suppose they belong more to my generation to them more than some of the generation of the people in the list listening today. So that mismatch is a problem. It's like saying we have an old world with plenty of fantastic toolkits, traditional HR, change management, employee engagement methods, etc. But there is a new world that actually those toolkits are very, very limited. And we need here social movements, ways of mobilizing people at a scale. Leadership is fine, but what about collective leadership, collective action? So all that it requires new lenses, new thinking, and this is where understanding culture as a social movement comes from. Uh, that's where it could, it could make a difference to what people try to do today, not what we're trying to do 10 years ago or five years ago. And one of the questions I have is, so where is the, this knowledge of for these new toolkits or new ways come from? Well, traditionally, you see that on the screen we have what? Well, we have conventional HR practices, uh, all the HR, a little bit of behavioral and social sciences, Quite frankly, not much. They never penetrated a lot the business area. There was a bit of music, but not a lot. Certainly behavioral change and change management. That is all also still there and in the background. But uh, what we have today is other new things coming along and say, wait a minute, I know how to mobilize people at a scale more than you. Um, political campaigning, political science, social marketing, social movements, digital marketing, all of these things that just a few years ago that were a little bit esoteric, come along and say, sorry, but we know more than you how to do these things. And actually what we do in Viral Change, for those of you who know, is to get all of that still unashamedly from any possible area that can tell us how to create change at the scale. And uh, so the old MBAs and the old approaches, they are not bad, they're still there, but they don't really by any means explain what is going on in the world of organizations today. So, so inevitably, we need to look at these things. Uh, we can't ignore them. We can't say, well, there are anecdotes. Not anymore, certainly not in 2017. Take change, for example. The, for many years, we've been using a traditional model, you and myself, anybody else, uh, which is a method approach, is, is the model one that I call, where you have an A and a Z, you have A, which is a point of departure, usually not very good, 
are usually bad. And a Z, which is a kind of promised land that when you get there, things are going to be better, although sometimes it doesn't. So it's a destination change. And the language here in that model is the language of the method. How do you do it? How much is going to cost? Where are the milestones? Where are the steps? And you have here the eight steps and the three steps and the nine steps model, etc. And that's fine. Then came along, other people came along and said, well, wait a minute. It, it's as much as, as important as it is to get to Z, how you get there is also important. So the journey people come along, the travelers, and say, I want to know what we are learning in this journey and then things like appreciative inquiry and other things come in and it becomes a very different model of change it's still perhaps superimposed to the number one but a little bit different some people took that seriously some people didn't and some people still said give me the method tell me how to get to that that what matters to me how we get is not interesting but there is a third way which is the one that actually includes both of the above, but it takes care mainly of how to build capacity for change. So as opposed to change something from A to B is to create change ability, to create a DNA, a behavioral fabric, a culture, whatever you call it, that actually allows you to change anything. It is what you want to do. It's called culture and that requires a platform not a method, and I'll explain that in a second. And also, that is what is behind a social movement. That is what a social movement is about. So just to, just to clarify here, a method at the top uh, you have is, has goals and deliverables and lots of project management, and this is where the old change management sits. But a social movement needs a platform. It has a cause. And it has something at the end that you can call goals. I prefer to call it, what do we want to see? And that is the social movement. But the, the thing that links the cause and this end is not a method, it's a platform. And it's not just a change of words. I'll, I'm gonna show you in a second what the platform for us at the Child Forum project is, because uh, uh, that's what I know. There may be other kinds of platforms. I'm not saying it's the, the only one, but the one that we, have developed for many years by chains, for example, contains these components. It's a synchronized and organized operating system. So in reality, we are installing an operating system as opposed to a method. And it has organizational principles, for example, the combination of pool and pool systems. It has behavioral rules on what's gonna work and what doesn't. It has social algorithms of the type if we do A, we, if, whenever we find A, we always do B, for example. It has a, a need to calibrate the formal and the informal organization because most of the traditional ways have been banking on the formal side. Uh, we know about meetings, committees, teams, structures, tax forces, and re-engineering the structure, but we knew little, and certainly we do know quite a lot today about the informal organization, and most of this stuff happens in the informal organization. So it calibrates that. Also contains storytelling and uh, the crafted narratives that link the whole thing. A form of leadership that is called, we call backstage leadership because it's very different. It's the leadership at the top supporting from the back everything that is going on. It has some particular management roles, which are the different is a way of engaging activists into peer-to-peer -peer networks, so that needs to be orchestrated. We work on purpose with internal tribes, that layers of people that the organization has. There is a metric system and there are stress tests. So I don't want to go in that into detail. Anybody willing to discuss it with me offline, I'm very happy to do it. But that is our platform, and I repeat, maybe other forms. But as you can see, this is a little bit more sophisticated than a method that takes you from A to B. This is creating a lasting environment, a DNA, a way of working, an operating system. We call it a mobilizing platform. So we need that for a uh, uh, social movement. So what is that we have in a social movement? Well, as I said before, we have on one side a course. On the other side, we have the goals and objectives. And in between, we have 
a platform. No platform, no social movement. And within this journey from cost to goals and objectives, there are lots of things that happen. And sometimes there are one-off things, like people do lots of training and awareness days and, and off-sites and things like that. That in itself does not constitute a social movement. There are like peaks of activities, which by the way, we are very good at. We love that. We love to put people together in a workshop situation uh, and off-site. And, and, you know, and it, has, it has a logic and it has a need, but it doesn't create a social movement, no matter how you try. It will be equivalent on the ones that the bars that you have there on, in blue and on the political and social change arena, the protests, the demonstrations, the activities, the rituals, as the social movement people call them, the rituals repertoire which they have a role, but demonstrations per se don't create a social movement. Demonstrations are demonstrations. And as I say, they have a role. Uh, but how many do you want to have or you need to have before you are creating a serious uh, um, um, social movement? So what is a social movement? What is the definition that is behind? Well, let's have it in more detail. It is it's a organized use of a mobilizing platform, systematic collective action for a defined purpose of sustainable social change under particular types of leadership. Wow, I'm sure you are going to remember all of that word by words. I know you won't, but don't worry, you'll have the slides. You can have a look at what you want. But let me unpack that because on purpose, every single word this matters to understand the difference between the platform and the rest. Organized. It needs to be orchestrated. It doesn't happen from the sky. It, is, it needs a good backstage design. Systematic. It's not something that you create as a one-off series of activities. It needs a campaign style, something that you know what's going to happen today, what's going to happen in three months, six months, and you have that organized from the background. Collective action is not about what the small groups do and the leadership team is better now and the leadership program for them. It's about the collective action of the organization. Define purpose. has to be very clear. Maybe different converging goals, but has to be very clear what it is that you want to achieve. And it's not just necessarily, well, the mission and the vision. It could be a little bit more than that. Sustainable. It has to create lasting capacity, change ability. No lasting capacity is not a social movement, is a series of shots, which again could have their own role, but that's what it is. Social change. That means large scale behavioral change. It's not a small change. It's not the change that happens in privileged groups that attend some workshops, but then what happens with the other 20,000 people in the organization, you don't know. And types of leadership, you need to orchestrate at least these three components. I'll go to that a little bit later. The hierarchical system, the distributed leadership, and what we call backstage leadership. So, What is not is moving lots of people around to lots of workshops, a change management program, uh, rebranded, but still a change management program. Uh, it's not design thinking. It's not just a series of high emotion and um, high octane initiatives that the organization has like flash mobs or massive training program, all the same as you've done before, but just sticking now the words grassroots and bottom up. That is not a social movement. This is something that may attempt to be, but it's not what it is. And a social movement has, as you can see, their own life cycles. Uh, they are not all the time uh, in, same, in the same place. Um, sometimes you start, then they spread. There is a, an attention, goals may be achieved, a social movement, in the macro social area that has to do, for example, with changing a piece of legislation. Well, once this is done, it's done, and you can say that's been achieved. And then sometimes these movements either continue or they die, or they get absorbed somewhere else or transform into another social movement of some kind. Sometimes get absorbed by mainstream, uh, which is not a very good idea, and sometimes they die. So at any point in, point in time, you could find yourself 
in any of these 12 points. And I think it's incredibly important that leaders in organizations treating culture as a social movement understand our way and in a humble way say, where are we in this progression? Are we in the spreading phase? Are we goals achieved? Well, probably not. Are we going to sideline and absorb somewhere else? Or are we in decline or are we dead? Which is another possibility. To me, I had a conversation very recently with people when they asked me which, which one do you think is the worst of the points? Obviously, the, the obvious one is death, but I, think, I still think there is one that is worse than death. It's five, it's plateau. When you are just nicely carry on and you don't realize that uh, either you're going to decline or you have enormous possibilities that you're not achieving, but things seem okay. To me, that's the worst place to be but you may think otherwise. So it's important to know where you are in this social movement evolution of the culture at the point in time. Don't kid yourself. Don't call it uh, goals achieved if that's not what is happening. But also, it's a scale. It is a scale up or it isn't. You have these two worlds that some of you have heard me many times from my Homo Emittance book, the push world, which is a communication awareness training world, which you aim at many people to do something, and then some people pay attention, and from the people who pay attention, some people think of doing something, and eventually there is a little bubble of people doing something. And you have the pool world, which is the world of behaviors and social culture and change, which is the other way around. Some people start doing something, other people copy that, good or bad, creates a critical mass, and suddenly you have a culture and everybody's doing something in a particular way, good or bad. But it's a very, very different two worlds that we need to master, the push and the pull at the same time. But the mathematics, and this is incredibly important for this conversation today, are very, very different. The world one, which is a world of attrition that goes from, from big to small, is an addition world. You grow there by adding bodies, by adding people. How many more workshops, how many people, how many town halls, how many, uh, whatever you call it. So you have here 500 people to train, for example, and you have done it with 250. There is no brain, there are another 250 to go. So you add by adding, by adding, by bodies, and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, if you want to reach 10,000 people, I don't know how many years will it take you to carry on doing that, but good luck. Well, the world too, where behaviors is the currency, is a multiplication world. Somebody doing something, engage with others, and each of them engage four or five people, or, or, or contaminate good about other five people, or each of them bring another, pick a number, six, seven, ten, you create a movement because it's a multiplication. So it's clear that the worlds are very different. It's a choice. I mean, not one is not better than the other. They are just very different. It's important to know where you are. If you are a leader in an organization thinking you are creating a social movement of some sort or large scale mobilization by using only, and I stress the word only, a push one world of addition, you will never get there. But you know, it may be very nice to go with millions of workshops and around the world, but that is not to create more than many people are aware and many people sen sensitize and many people train, don't get me wrong, there is a lot of merit of that, but it doesn't necessarily change the culture. So you need to know where you're going to do, but to be clear, no multiplication, no social movement. If you don't see multiplication, you may have lots of very good activities, but you can't call that a social movement in the sense of mobilizing large scale numbers of people. Now, I mentioned before leadership, and I won't be able to unpack that in detail, but at least you have to take care one way or another of these three forms of leadership, which we call like that, you don't have to. One is the hierarchical leadership, which is very clear, the top-down systems, which they are not going away, uh, no matter what people say. Uh, there is, however, the number two, which is the distributed leadership, which not many people pay a lot of attention, which is all those networks of, let me call them natural leaders. There are many ways to call them, who are really leaders in their own rights, but they are not necessarily very high in the organization chart. 
they are highly connected, some of them, some of them, some less. They are the real leaders. This engine of distributed leadership is very, very strong in many normal organizations, but we don't know what to do with them, but they are the real engine. And then in between, there is something that we call backstage leadership, which is the hierarchical leadership supporting the distributed leadership, but not interfering with that. So let it be with some rules, with some borders, but knowing that actually the hierarchical leadership is less powerful than the entire sum of themselves, the distributed leadership in the backstage leadership. So somewhere in the platform, whatever one you use, somewhere in the social movement, you need to deal with this collective leadership. In other words, it's not anymore today about a good single approach leadership development program for leaders. That's fine. That's very good for those leaders. And you do that hoping that by doing that, then they will do something with the troops. But it's more today about creating collective leadership capacities. It's richer. And there are many pockets of leadership and you need to tap into that and do something about that. And that's part of what a social movement requires and a platform in between has. So it's not a theory. Actually, we've been doing that for many years in, in pharma, financial services, telecoms, uh, civil engineering, public sector, oil and gas, public health. So it, it's not a theory. It works. It's a practice, as I said at the beginning. And that's how we do it. You may want to do it in a different way, but these are the components that we have, which are the same, as I mentioned before, I will go through. It's about narratives, the peer-to-peer -peer networks, the behavioral base, the backstage leadership, the metrics that always, always needed, storytelling, etc. Again, happy to talk to you offline on that, if needed. Something, I use this slide that you have here as something that, uh, with, with many people, with groups, sometimes with, with, uh, uh, with um, associations, with uh, management teams, and it's a very simple slide, and the question is very simple. What do you want to be? What do you want to be in this collective action identity world? Do you want to be a protest group? People who actually are very good at protesting. Is that a political party? Oh, no, no, really, no, no. Is it a club? Are you a defense association or something because you need you you are attacked and are you a talking show um my god you know we are very good at that so some organizations are run as a permanent talking show people talk to each other all the time in very single meetings but you know never stop talking but nothing happens it's a think tank it's, it's just a production of good ideas but you don't know what's going to happen it's a pressure group are you going to influence something which is fine are you or you want to be an information traffic center, which is you know lots of massive amounts of information and very good reports and market research and everything else going up and down the system, uh, incredibly traffic, but you don't know what's happening. Are you going to be or want to be just broadcasters and commentators or anything happens, etc. And there is lots of question marks and probably you can add another uh, ten or twenty boxes. The point is, you need to decide what you want. Because if you want a social movement, you can't have one and organize yourself like a club, or organize yourself as a talking show. You have to have a platform. You have to have a scale. And it, you know what happens if you have you know, 50 guys talking around. So it may be simplistic, but I'm always amazed how organizations don't expect, and it works all, even associations, of professional associations are very good at that, are saying, yeah, we know we have rules, etc. but we are somewhere in between a club and a think tank and a little bit of talking show. But by the way, we want to be a social movement. Really? Well, if you do, you better have the mechanism to do it because if not, don't call it like that. So that's an important uh, thing to, to have in mind. Now, back to the beginning. The new world. We need to understand the culture is not something that you have something that our culture is, is something that is a social movement, that is in constant progress, and that needs a lot of recalibration. Actually, when people talk to me about having a robust culture, my adrenaline goes up, because any robust culture is 
close to dead. You can't be robust and survive. You have to have enormous flexibility and quite frankly, make get things wrong many, many times. It's a recalibration all the time. And that recalibration, for example, may entail at some point, going back to one of the principles behind before having a lot of world one formal organization, but then switching to creating a more space for the informal organization, for the peer-to-peer -peer networks. So it's not one or the other, it's both of them, but you need to recalibrate. Now, the toolkit or toolkits for this large scale mobilization of people, which I don't know how else we can call it, is certainly not within the traditional HR or the leadership training. There is a role and a place for that. But for today's world, they need more than that. They need more than that, that traditional approach. And the sources of knowledge, as I mentioned before in one of my bubble slides, is they are probably, most surely, outside the conventional business disciplines. Is in political science, is in social marketing, is in the, uh, in the uh, you, you can learn more about mobilizing people by studying in detail the Obama campaigns than by going to an MBA, believe me. So there is no option but getting into this if this is what you want to do. It's not just a theory or something interesting. And, and I said at the end, just a little bit in joking, forget the MBA, learn epidemiology. But actually, it's true. It's about infecting others. It's about creating a scale, by creating that movement, and that is an infection model. It's not a broadcasting model. It's not something that you bombard people all the time with something like that. So. I'm going to stop here because um, uh, I've got close to half an hour, which is uh, not bad for me. And I, I know it's gonna, uh, there are a few uh, questions there in the, which I'm going to try to, uh, to see them in my, on my screen. And I'm going to try to answer uh, some of them um, because uh, they, are, they are very good. I can read now a few of them. Forgive me, this is, wasn't gonna be a, or can't, couldn't be a more live interaction, but that's good enough. So I have, um, uh, have one that says, Richard uh, says, talking about tribes, could you provide further insights on what kind of tribes play a role? How do you identify the right people? That's very good. That's very good uh, question, Richard, from, or from, from uh, Germany. Uh, it's not that difficult, actually, because the tribes are very well known in many organizations. Um, uh, there are there are there are the functional tribes, and this is the, the most uh, the, the traditional ones. I mean, then you have the you have the, the IT tribe, and you have the finance tribe, and you have the R and D tribe. I worked in pharmaceuticals for many years, and the medics are a tribe. So these layers talk to each other, and sometimes don't talk to anybody else. So I want to know what's happening there. But there are other tribes that are not that functional. They are different. For example, part timers are a tribe. Uh, moms coming back from maternity leave are a tribe, remote workers are a tribe, and what we've done, the homework in some organizations, uh, not surprisingly, but people come say, actually, there, is, there are other tribes here, which are the smokers, for example, or people who disappear, online, or people who go to the gym together. This is not trivial anymore. It's not just an anecdote. Is knowing that the organization is not just composed by what the organization chart tells us in terms of the layers, but also all that stuff. And so once you know them, you need to engage with them and then call them and engage with them. And, and I would start sometimes just by knowing what is that they make them tick, because the chances are it's going to be very different from, or from what uh, that the functional uh, sites are. So, so you have to identify and try. Let me see. Um, um, uh, okay, there is, a, there is a, another question here. Um, I still have a few minutes, so that's good. Uh, saying, how can changeability be achieved if there are people in the company who are still sticking to the past mm -hmm. and are afraid of a simple, simply, again, simply again, what is new? That's absolutely true. It's a very good question. Um, and there are lots of these people around. Again, I don't expect me to give you a magic answer, but what I'm going to say is that it's all social. Don't try it on an individual basis. So uh, attempts to focus on these three following individuals who are the difficult ones and, uh, you know, good luck. But if you 
could create groups of people in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Actually, they are not afraid of that and they are willing to try, willing to experiment. That group effect is fantastic. So the question is, technically, how many of the ones who are afraid of, and maybe afraid of, but not necessarily against, could we, tr could we transplant, let me use that term, into a group of peers, particularly peers because that's more powerful, that actually see things in a different way. Let's create a dialogue between the ones and the others, but don't try, that's my suggestion, forcing a rational conversation about to these people about change is good, uh, I don't know why you are resistant, and don't worry about it, and the rest and the rest, because that, that is just a waste of time. So it's a social phenomenon, and you need to orchestrate that, and it's doable. We do that many, many times when we do immoral change peer to peer with groups that some of them are very up, you know, avant garde, and other people who are less, and we just mix them up. And the group effect on the, um, the group effect is it, the self contamination, if you want to call it like that, is much, much powerful than anything that is more individual. Okay, I hope I have answered a little bit of that. Okay, let me see if I have the list. Um, um, uh, Sarah, uh, so does, does the social movement happen differently within different demographics? That's a very, very good question. Actually, the answer, you know, the answer, my honest answer is, I don't know. Because in, in, in all work that we do in most of our organizations, there is a complete mix up of all the generations. And I have, have to, check to find, and I know this is politically perhaps incorrect, a differentiated element that says you do that with this generation, that with the other. Obviously, the generations are different and we know what makes them tick. But I wouldn't really worry too much about that. Again, it's a group effect, it's a group effect, it's a social effect. So uh, that is more powerful and faster than worrying about the different segmentation in terms of generations, which I'm not against that. It just has never given me any extra handle on what to do different. Um, uh, let me see, uh, Zach uh, Blumenfields, I think it is. How do you think technology plays a factor in company culture and employee engagement? Can technology help with this humanistic problem? I think it can. I, you know, technology can do anything you want. Uh, it, it is the problem is how you use it and how it's overused or how sometimes we have expectations that don't match the reality and just to pick one and it's, i'm not tackling all the technology at all but it's all the question of connectivity we are hyper connected there is no question more than ever but there is hyper connectivity of anybody able to talk to anybody and engage with anybody if you wanted to does not create hyper collaboration at all actually we are not more collaborative than before that we have less connectivity. So connectivity and collaboration they are not the same. And both would require is a behavioral change in which people want to collaborate. Then the technology does, does the trick. So is a factor, is there, there is no question, but you have to treat it with uh, critical thinking around how much this is going to be. I've, I've seen in my life, um, yeah, my clients are spending millions on systems that are technologically incredibly sexy of everybody being able to deal with everybody online and offline and the rest and the rest. So my God, you feel this is just gonna change the whole thing. Really, some cases, it just feels like a massive talking show, but that's not create per se uh, a social movement or changing culture. Usually properly, of course, that would be wonderful, but you need a behavioral set that is going to, uh, to help that. Uh, let me see some, uh, I have probably a little bit of extra time. Um, um, let me see what else there in the list. Uh, who create, uh, Mark, who creates the narrative and what are the key principles in creating a compelling narrative? That, that is a very, very good question because a narrative is, is not compelling until somebody's compelled. For by the narrative, so you have to test it. There is no. It's like people want to say, can 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 we have a, a a marketing a piece of marketing that is viral? No, it's not viral until it gets viral. Before that is a set of words. So here is the same. So a compelling narrative needs to be compelling. We use two components here. One is the top down, which is 
more traditional and usually has started with the leadership team and there is nothing wrong with that you can say well that's part of the role so um, um uh, uh, you know, in, in a traditional way, we can create something about that. But then you have the bottom-up narrative, and they talk to each other, and the bottom-up nar bottom narrative is the storytelling system. is the real day-to-day, -day, sometimes prosaic stories that are happening, they're coming up and saying, look, this is the reality, and how this reality matches the top-down narrative. And it's a recalibration between both. I've seen like probably you have in many cases a relatively sort of well-crafted um, agency-led top-down narrative that says well that looks good on paper or even the slides or whatever with lots of workshops but it's not it's not linking with the other narrative which is the bottom-up so in the platform and in the social movement you have both you have what's happening in the ground all the time trying to match what is being said by the top and modifying each other all the time so in fact it's a it's a journey of the narrative itself, anything that has something too fixed. I don't know for how long it will last. So uh, um, you start somewhere, but you need to match with the other end. Pull and push, top and bottom, that's how it works, at least, at least for us. Um, uh, there is Chris uh, with a question to ask directly, which companies, organizations are leading the way in adopting value chain? Lots of them. Unfortunately, I don't have the luxury of giving you lots of names, but but uh, it's been pharmaceuticals, financial services, school transportation. Not all of them, obviously. I mean, I don't. I can't claim that this is universal. If that was the case, probably I wouldn't be here and will be sort of enjoying happy retirement somewhere. But uh, but it's certainly becoming more and more the norm, and we are having a fantastic. Uh, a role to play very honor in the public sector and in the health sector uh, in Ireland uh, and that I say because it's in the public domain so you can see these incredibly well managed and uh, social uh, movements going on in many parts of organizations some of them are in year one some of them are in year two year three but it is happening it's not a u-turn on that thanks for asking that direct question let me see what this I'm going to pick something more that has more um, the tribes. I dealt with that. Um, uh, ah, Richard. Oh, no, sorry, Rachel. Rachel, sorry, Rachel. Uh, dear Rachel, how do you persuade the leadership team to adopt the viral change model even though um, you move now? Uh, in my conflict, the traditional notions of what a change program looks like, Thanks for the great talk. So, so okay. So, thanks uh, back to you. Uh, how? Well, I wonder sometimes whether brainwashing is an option, but uh, uh, usually it doesn't work. So, uh, if I let me let me start at the end. If I had to wait for uh, an entire leadership team team of any company to really get the whole thing and understand that there are better ways i wouldn't be here talking to you i would be so depressed by now oh you don't need everybody you just need a few people who are able to click to understand in some cases there are senior people some of them are younger generations that express things such as it must be a better way of dealing with this thing because we tried before nothing changes, we've gone around the circles with many of these communication systems. So you always have people who are able to click and engage and you need to demonstrate to them the benefit, the business benefit. I have many, many potential clients and some of them becoming clients who come to me uh, with uh, falling in love with viral chains and then say, I need to find somebody in an organization that they want to do viral change. Well, that doesn't work. You don't do viral change for the sake of doing viral change. You need to find is a business problem, a business situation, a piece of culture that needs to change, whether it's in the agility, internal processes, customer centrism, safety, whatever, which requires a social movement, which requires a platform. And then you start, you have to explain the benefits. Imagine that tomorrow, today, there are 500 people, pick a number, who are doing that and that and that, because they copy other people, because that was installed by peers, no instructions from the top, would you like to have that? If people say, yes, sure, I'd like to have that. Well, then you are in the first part of the conversation towards, well, there are mechanisms to do that. So 
uh, how you convince people don't expect a universal answer but intelligent people and good managers and leaders and we have lots they just do understand that there are better ways to do it and they are willing to, at the very least to explore possibilities uh, and there are and then you are in the, the first steps towards uh, imagining a different way of creating a culture and shaping an entire organization let me see i've had something else here um uh let me see um my colleague is helping me here with the how can technology help is that marcus how can technology help in initiating social movement thanks marcus and lovely to have you there um um uh, i don't know i don't i don't i haven't seen many examples of technology initiating helping yes i mean sometimes when we get into an organization with a technology piece is very important quite frankly and that may be completely historical so so therefore not terribly useful to you is been trying to rescue in something so a crm system that nobody uses an erp system that is very bad you know technology is there people have tried but they have forgot surprise surprise the behavioral side so they think that the technology just triggers lots of people doing and they do trigger but it's not sustainable necessarily so when we're going with technology is sometimes as a trigger a helper or trying to rescue something that is not happening uh, initiating per se well yes all technology initiates things because if i use my iphone and a new app and things like that then obviously uh, i am initiating but the question is how sustainable that is because nudging new behaviors triggering new behaviors that easy uh, you know easy no problem it's the same as getting people on the street to demonstrate easy the question is how sustainable that's going to be are we lasting change in the business lasting change and the answer is we don't know then technology like anything else is a minor element okay uh my colleagues are telling me here next to me that i have a, a room for another um another uh question dan uh, dan schneider my dear friend dan thanks for being here again do organizations need a cause to effectively mobilize a movement and if so does that narrative or language differ depending on hierarchy geography demography demographic etc yes they do need a cause uh the problem is that it could be articulated in different ways one of my rules and i have 25 of them which i hope in a next uh, master class i could go through that uh, rules for mobilizing people in the uh, it's called um, it, it starts by saying uh, it's a host of motivations meaning meaning you can have different causes you can have different angles but you have to be very clear what the ultimate cause is so different motivations is fine but then it has to be non-negotiable behavior so you can come from different angles you can see the world different worlds but you have to have a complete agreement on what the direction is. otherwise you don't have a social movement you have a movements in 20 different directions which is not very good that is the problem that people have when they think as an aside that putting extraordinary um passionate people in a room together creates a social movement and that's nonsense what you you give me 50 passionate people and you may get about 100 different directions so um i said before many times and people laugh and some of them maybe don't like it. i say that when I, I say passion is overrated and i mean by that that per se great but actually it could keep get you in the wrong direction so a social movement needs a cause needs the passion of people but certainly above all is hard work and well organized platform and but yes you need a cause and you and i don't think it's something that you craft in the back of an envelope one day is something that is crafting progressively to a point so but you have to have a sense of direction what i call towards a place in the world uh, that's the term that, that i use more than the mission and the vision etc again a, a very good conversation for another day i'm going to stop here and uh because i've reached my cross to 45 minutes which was what it was planned i thank you very much to all of you for being there for all the questions uh for your patient uh, hope i haven't bombarded you with many things i'm very very happy myself or any of my team to carry on this conversation uh, offline anytime 
and uh, and uh, most likely we have some plans for um, uh, new webcasts and new uh, uh, master classes and you will be informed of that is that what you want think again thanks very much have a very good evening or morning thanks goodbye